Hi, my name is Juwan, and this is Sicko Podcast. Thank you for, for reaching out. You're the first person, I think, to reach out um, to be on the podcast. The second person is, is Wawa. Um, okay. <laughs> so I'm going to talk to him like on Sunday. But, you know, the reason, I mean, first of all, just, hi, what's up, man? How you doing? Um, I'm good. Um, quarantine, got everybody stressed right now. Yeah. Uh, I live in Georgia now. I moved back. I moved here in December. Um, I don't know. Just been l- living life post college. Um, I pl- I haven't gotten my degree yet. Um, for a bunch of different reasons. Maybe we'll get back. Maybe we'll get into it later. Yeah. Um, but. You know, I'm just down here trying to get settled, trying to become financially stable outside of school. Yeah. Um, I felt like I've been in Syracuse for a really long time. Um, for in five years, I've probably spent all of those months in Syracuse, not not home at all. So it's been it's been good to be back home, um, to relax, to decompress, to think about other things other than academics. Um, and just to see how life is outside of the public college. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely feel you on that. Um, being back home, I mean, I visited during during my time in, in Syracuse, but, you know, being out of Syracuse is definitely a bubble. And, you know, especially, you know, just in the minority community, um, you know, you, you could really just create your own bubble in Syracuse, at least while we were there, of just chilling, you know, with the culture, with your, with your own people. And of course, you know, there's outside bullshit that you deal with. And, you know, we've seen that with Not Again SU. But, you know, it's it's a bubble. It's a bubble. Um, when, did, when did you get back to Georgia? Um, so I moved in. So my mother moved down here in, I want to say, around September-ish. Um, I convinced her to move down here. We lived upstate for... Since the time I've been in the U.S., I moved there when I was about eight from um, from St. Lucia. Um, lived in East Flatbush, then I lived in East New York, then I moved to Philly. Um, and my mom said that she was going to look for a house, so I, was, I told her, Let, "Let's get out from from upstate. Um, let's go to a warmer climate." So I told her, "Look into Georgia. Houses are pretty cheap down here." Um, so she moved in about September and. At the end of December, because um, I was still working in Syracuse, um, I moved down here. Bad. Damn. You, you moved around a lot, you know, growing up. Uh, yeah, bro. Um, I left, so I left St. Lucia when I was 13 months old. Mm-hmm. I moved to Canada when I was 13 months. I lived there till I was seven, and I moved back to St. Lucia for about 11 months, and then I moved here at eight. Damn. So I around. How was that? Was that was that like interesting to like see different areas or did it get old? Um, I'd say living so my first memories of life came when I was living in Canada. Um there were some good, some bad. Um but overall I think my, my, my experience of living in Canada was a good one. I met my first friends there. We're still friends today. Um, and it's, it, it's been, um, the downside to all of it is moving around so much. I never had a sense of stability. Um, so especially when it came to school, I always got transferred. I think when I was in elementary school, before I graduated elementary school, I had been to at least four or five different elementary schools before I graduated. Yeah, moving all the time. Um, so and I think that's actually impacted my life in a way where um, I don't, I don't, when I do sense stability, I have a hard time staying grounded with it, if that makes sense just because of my life has been so uncertain in terms of moving around all the time. Um, and you look even now, I, I just moved about six months ago again. Um, 
And who knows how long I'm going to stay here too. So, you know, in terms of that aspect, there hasn't really been much stability. So when I do find it, I don't really, it doesn't really feel safe. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Like for me, you know, I, I did not move around a lot. I, I had like maybe two big moves as, as a kid. Uh, I moved to the U.S. to New York City from Mozambique uh, in Africa mm-hmm. when I was seven and stayed in the Heights in a Dominican neighborhood um, till basically till I graduated. I was just there. So that was just my stability. And then after graduation, I come home and my parents are like, oh, my dad is like, oh, I got a job offer. We're moving to Flatbush. And I was like, what? <laughs> so... It was just it was just more annoying than anything. Just like moving and all those boxes and and learning you a new address and shit like that. But you know that's just regular for you. And and to your point of just not of stability is instability. It's 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 basically moving around. That's that's where you're used to. So you know being uncomfortable, staying in a place for too long, makes makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. Have have you been doing a lot of like introspecting during quarantine since there's not much to do? So, um, <clears throat> so because I got laid off from my job, um, once everything started getting affected down here, right? Um, I work at a Honda dealership. Um, so I was an internet sales consultant, um, for Honda. And I had just started in January when I got down here. And in March, they had to let me go. So I wasn't really there for that much time. Um, But in the time that I was there, I absolutely love the job that I do. I can see myself doing it for a very long time because it's performance driven. My success is determined off of what I do. So if I wake up 8 in the morning and I'm there till till 8 at night and I'm putting in the work, my the numbers I hit is going to reflect that, and the money I make is also going to reflect, reflect that. From the moment I started that job, my managers always told me, um, "This is a business that if you dedicate yourself, you'll make more than doctors, you'll make more than dentists." Um, the person who hired me told me she has a dentist friend, um, and she she's always like, um, you know, I have a friend who went to school for X amount of years. I never graduated, but I make more money than her. Um, and she said, the way you do that is outside of this business or even within this business, you always have to look at how are you going to make your money when you're not making money. So um, so after getting laid off, a big chunk of what I've been doing is, okay, so now that I'm not working, how do I make money? What can I create? What business can I make for myself? that would allow me to make money even when I'm not physically going outside to work. What can I do? So I've been looking into investing in stocks and I've always wanted to get into stocks for years. Um, I haven't found the right time to one, what do I want to invest in? Two, with everything happening in quarantine, what do I really invest in? Um, And just the instability of what the markets are like or what products are people wanting right now that I can sell? Um, but being an entrepreneur has probably been the my top focus since since quarantine, since being let off. What can I do to really elevate myself on a financial level to where I can eventually build generational wealth for for generations to come in my family? Yeah, I I definitely feel that, man. Cause you know, same thing. Same thing happened to me. Basically, I started working in September uh, in sales as well. I was an enterprise business development rep. Um, so we we sold B two B, and and you know it was going good. And you know I was working for a startup, so I I knew that that was a risk in itself. But the reason why I wanted to to work for a startup company was because I want to have my own company one day. I want to be an entrepreneur myself. And, you know, companies that are starting off, you can just soak in everything as you're doing your job. Mm-hmm. And I was, I was doing that. It was, was, doing, it was going great. Then, you know, obviously COVID hit and the financial crisis hit. And myself and a bunch of people in my team 
were laid off and it was just like fuck like this like life is just getting started i'm taking my first steps and you know selfishly speaking it's like why now why couldn't this be like in a couple years where things were a little bit more stable and and shit like that and the only thing that really could make me look at it half full was that it was happening to everybody millions of people are off the job and it kept happening to people so it's really all right this is the reality and much like you i looked into what can i start what can i do to you know gain some money and also just learn and invest in myself and and yeah i recently started or trying to start uh, have you heard of amazon fba I I, that's another thing that i also recommend it's basically like you know when you go to amazon any, anything you see on the pages most of those uh, products are sold by regular people uh, or like teams. They're not necessarily from companies. And and what those people do is Amazon has a program called Amazon FBA where um, you buy products from suppliers through Alibaba.com or wherever you get suppliers. And those suppliers are based in China. So let's say a charger. So you search a charger on Alibaba you order 500 or however, however much you want to, you can negotiate with the supplier and then they send that to an Amazon facility. So that Amazon has in their warehouse center. And once it's there, you can create a product listing. So you could like, just like the picture of the charger, just like you see on Amazon and the description, you'd create that. And, and yeah, you try to sell it. And the way that you get exposures, you do some marketing, email marketing or whatever. You try to get on the first page or the second page and, you know, whatever you sell, Amazon would take a certain percentage of it. And, you know, and then it's like, it's like a business. There's a profit, there's expenses, and your goal is to run out, run the shipment out and, and shit like that. So I, I've been trying to do that um, recently because uh, I don't know if you know Dave, David's girlfriend, Vanessa. She, she's really good at that and she's actually, she's actually who inspired me to to try okay so Amazon FBA stocks and and YouTube is, is what I'm trying to do man and it's tough it's tough I even thought about going back to school but I was like 40k for for a master's <laughs> it's so much money it's a it's a scam man yeah and um a lot of these jobs nowadays that aren't salaried require you to have a master's and it doesn't make sense to me. Mm -hmm. You're not giving me a salary. I have to work hourly and I have to go to school and for me to get this master's that you're requiring me to have, I'm going to put myself in a hundred plus K of debt to obtain it for an hourly, for an hourly wage. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, shout out to people who are getting masters and shit. But it's just, it's just, it's a decision that that's tough to make, um, especially just depending on your degree, because you can't just get any master's degree. There, there's some that are more valuable than others. And just the way jobs are, especially in New York City, it's kind of disrespectful. But I think that's just across the board, for especially for entry-level people. You gotta, they want you to just to grind and they give you disrespectful offers. Like, I've gone a couple of offers like since because I'm, I'm still applying for jobs and shit but i've rejected all of them because it's just like um if, if i if i if i don't really want to i don't want to just get a job just to get a job otherwise I, I just won't do it well and and yeah yeah and, and especially with the offers they have so i've been I've, I've just been chilling man trying to invest in other other things okay i feel you about um, not wanting to get a job just to get a job, because especially during everything that's happened, my mother has been nagging me to, oh, apply to federal jobs, apply to federal jobs. And I keep telling her, I'm not going to do that because I've always been the type of person. Yes, there's probably some stability in the fact that I have this government job. Um, and in times like this, maybe I won't, I wouldn't have gotten laid off, but one, I'm not going to enjoy going to work every day and doing that government job that I know I don't like. Um, and the only reason I'm doing it is just so that I wouldn't have gotten fired or 
I'm making a set amount of money. But I keep telling her, look, I'm doing something right now where they ask me to get out of bed and get there at 8 in the morning. I got to stay there until 8 at night. I work Monday to Monday through Saturday, um, the last Sunday of every month. Um, do that. And in bonuses, your base salary is about 2K, and then your your bonuses is about 5K for the month. Right? Yeah. So I'm not going to pass up the opportunity where I'm betting on myself and my own success just for a job I'm not going to be happy doing. I'd rather be happy doing what I'm doing, have the freedom of growing, working with, not even just working with and for people of color, which is really important to me, um, and people who motivate me and want to see me succeed the same way they do. The GM of my store, of, of the Honda I work at, he was in prison at one point, and now he's the general manager. He's a black man, and he's the face of the Honda I work at. And he says, I'm going to treat the janitor. He wakes up every day. He's outside. He'll sweep. He'll restock the fridge. He'll do whatever. And he does it because he says, yeah, I'm the GM, but people need to see that I'm a black man, even though I do have this power. I'm going to still do the same job that, that I that I ask my janitors to do or that I'm going to ask any one of you to do. Right. Because... At the end of the day, someone got to do it. If I have to do it, I'm going to do it. So I'm not going to give up an opportunity to work with somebody who has a position like that in which you don't see of people like color and is so humble to the point where he can have any regular conversation with you. And the number one thing he wants to do, especially for another black man, is to pass down the knowledge no one else gave him. That's like buying, buying into the culture, but not just into the culture in terms of the company you work for, but just the, the people that you respect within the company and prioritizing your own happiness in terms of how you attain that success rather than just grinding and doing what you gotta do to survive. Growing up, I, I think we've all seen that cliche of corporate or whatever, just in general, adults hating their job, but still staying in that environment of, like, of to toxicity and unhappiness because they're doing what they got to do. And I think that that's something that we're, our generation isn't necessarily accepting, um, along with a bunch of other shit that comes that that's like from the old days mm -hmm. in terms of just that corporate world, in terms of suit and tie, professionalism, look a certain way, and that's what's considered professional. Um, that's already changing in, in modern businesses. Like startups, I was like walking to work with a shirt, made some sweats some days, um, just whatever, and that was regular jeans, whatever. That suit and tie aspect of things isn't isn't necessary anymore. It's it's not that serious. It's just we're all humans. We're all we all know we need to make a living somehow, but we don't have to be screamed at by our boss or feel like shit just doing so. So I definitely think that's important. And and just speaking of just like. This quarantine in school, like I know, like most of my best friends that I grew up with are also, uh, are still in school actually. Um, because just because they switch, decided to switch majors or complications happen at school and, and this quarantine, just the way that it went down, um, how it, I think it exposed a lot of colleges and, and the fucked up system with these colleges, because some of them, like, even the established ones, like I heard Harvard was just kicking people out. You got one day to bounce <laughs> or or whatever. We're going to take your stuff. And international students, they didn't give a fuck about. People who needed time to get tickets, they didn't give a fuck about. They just were trying to protect themselves. And that shit's crazy to me. Just that like, these institutions. It's... It's funny you bring that up because you really get to see who who the school thinks about when they make the decisions and who they do not think about. Um, I remember, and you bring up, you only have a couple of days or not even, you, you really have a limited time, get your stuff and go. Um, and you just got to go. Okay, what about the kids? So let's say Syracuse, for example. 
What if you have the uh, HGLP and SSS students who you're telling me I have to go, but are you going to help pay for my bus ticket to get back to my family? What if I live in Florida? What if I live in, in California? You don't know where I live and you're telling me, okay, I, I just have to pick up and go. Can you help me make accommodations to make that happen? Or are you going to do that? Or is that just up to me? And I say that because I remember um, with the whole not again SU stuff that was happening on campus. Um, and I remember when the, a manifest came out. A manifest that came out about a school, sh- about someone who was trying to shoot up a school, right? And I remember just looking at the privilege of a lot of the students on campus to just say, oh, my family doesn't think it's safe. Next day, they're on a plane back home. Next day, they're they're home. And they're gone for the whole semester. For the rest of the semester, I remember kids were going back home um, because one, professors weren't going to have class if you didn't feel comfortable going to class. Not even just about the manifest, just with everything that was happening in the sit-in in the barn center. And when all that was going on, I remember the professors who said, you didn't have to go to school, to class. And it was the students who that wasn't affecting, using it as an opportunity to say, all right, bye, I'm going home. Next day, I'm on a plane back home. Your parents can't afford to do that. And for a lot of students on campus, I, I'm here for the whole semester. For the international students, even on break, I have to stay here. I can't just fly back and forth whenever I want to. So especially with, with the quarantine, when you just say, you got to go, where do you expect me to go? Right. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 one of the many, like, just that, that part and just in general with life, it's one of the many things that I just began to realize um, that was sort of accurate, like, when I grew up, like, oh, growing up and hearing the world's fucked up a little bit, that the world's a darker place than you think it is. Um, these businesses and institutions don't really care about you. Like Syracuse, for example, like going into Syracuse, I knew that, you know, there's a minority, there's a majority, obviously, but I did not expect the actual institution to be as racist as it is. Um, and it just seems to get a little worse or just our community seems to wake up a little more each semester. And that shit is crazy to me. Did you, did you expect that? Did you... Like, were you surprised? Um, was I surprised? No. But what angered me about Syracuse specifically was I just felt like there wasn't enough initiative from the school to even try to get better. Even when your students were pointing out there's a problem here, can you help fix it? Can you work with us? Can you listen to us and help fix the problem? There is no pro. I, I didn't feel like there was any proactive activity from the school. Um, so think about Theta Tau. When everything was happening with Theta Tau, um, and uh, there was a town hall meeting in in Hendrick Chapel, and there's always there was always that one dude with his with the afro and the glasses, one black dude who represented the, the school, who with everything everyone's concerns. You had people who were crying, students crying because they were angry that things keep happening and their voices aren't heard. The school isn't doing it. And we're telling you our voice, our voice isn't heard. And the response that you give us is, we hear you, we see you, um, and we're going to try to do better. And you heard that at least 10 times from this man. And I don't want to hear this political statement the school is asking you to say. Because that's all, that's all that we've ever seen for years of Syracuse with any issue, with any of these issues. There's never any genuine response to what students are saying. It's always, okay, here are the points. If, you, if they say this, here are your points. We hear you, we see you. That's your go-to. That's their go-to. Um, and you look at, think about, I, I always looked at the politics of SU. Um, and think about DPS, right? Take DPS, for example, the politics of DPS. 
in any DPS report, what's the one thing they never tell you in a DPS report? Um, about uh, whoever they're looking for. <laughs> they never said the race. They never tell you. Yeah. You're putting out this report about something happened. This person is wearing so-and-so. Okay, we're on a college campus. Everybody's wearing... Like, there's, they're, they're, you're not telling me anything. And I feel like they're scared to say, oh, a black individual or or something along those lines, but you're not telling me the things I need to know that I need to watch out for. But I also feel like that's might be to protect students in a way, um, to, to say that, okay, if I say this black student wearing basketball shorts um, or athletic wear, are my students going to then look at every, every black person who is wearing that and and think, oh, this is who they're talking about. Is that why they don't say it? I don't know. I really don't. But I always felt, felt like that was an interesting thing that DPS never did. Maybe they're doing it for good reasons. But there's there's a level of politics to SU that I don't understand that it gets in its own way when it comes to the daily operations of things. Look at the financial aid. Look at the financial aid center, right? There are... There is one financial aid advisor for the entire SSS and HEOP program. Shelly Crawford, I think she moved to a different position now. Right. But Shelly was the only financial aid advisor for hundreds of students. I was at SU for some for during the summer, and um, I had to appeal my financial aid. And you have one advisor. This is something that I need to continue to get federal funding from, to get federal funding and funding from the school. So from the time summer session one started, I was in I was in her office trying to set up appointments with Shelly so I can get things in order so I know what I got to do, right? Yeah. One advisor. Shelly's either not here, she's on vacation, she can't meet with me. Oh, so who can I meet with? Oh, we don't like to step on Shelly's toes. So when she gets back, well, we'll let you know. Okay. It's now it's the last week of summer session one, right? I haven't played for my classes for summer session one because I need this thing to go through with Shelly. Set up a meeting with Shelly. Okay, we're going to have you write this appeal um, and we're going to give it to the board for review. Then I asked her, okay, so do I get to speak to the board? about why I need why I need this funding or anything. She's like, no, we're going to write them a letter and then I'm going to present it to them and I'm going to argue on your behalf. And in my head, I'm like, you're the only counselor here and I've only seen you twice this entire summer after trying to set up an appointment with you almost every week so I could get this done. How are you going to effectively represent me in a case that has to do with me getting federal funding? and me still being able to go to, to, to attend SC. You can't do it. They rejected the appeal. And they tell you that, oh, whatever you wrote in your letter the first time, you can no longer use it in your appeal. So if I told you I am an SSS student who can't afford to go to SU without federal funding, I am about to graduate soon, I Literally, like, it's either this or I'm gone. If I told you all those reasons in the first in my in my letter, and you're going to tell me, yeah, once you do your appeal, you can't use that, I have nothing left to tell you. And on top of that, I can't represent myself. And Shelly was gone. She, she moved up. So now there's no representation for me. The person who's going to handle my case knows nothing about me, doesn't know me, and... I have to tell her, yeah, you don't know me. I've never met you this entire summer. You're new. Um, yeah, I told them everything the first time. I'm probably going to have to make something up right now. Can you defend me to make sure I, I, I get my funding to, so I can still go to my classes, so I can pay for my first session? How is that going to work? 
And it's the only people who's going to be affected by this are the minority students on campus. That that's who that's who's impacted by this because we only we only get one counselor. What is that going to do for us? That's crazy. Did did they tell you why they rejected your appeal? It was because yes. So it it all had to do with my major and everything, and I switched my major going to senior year. And the reason I switched my major coming to school. I wanted to go be an arts and science. I wanted to be a friend of sciences. And they put me in folk, right? They put me in folk, and I didn't have a good first semester freshman year. So when it came time for me to want to transfer out of folk to arts and science, the liberal arts college, they told me, oh, you needed a, you need a 3.0 GPA to do that. It never made sense to me. It's the liberal arts college. Why are you having, why do you have strict GPA requirements to transfer into the liberal arts school. So I was stuck in fault, a public health major, something I never wanted to do. And similar to the jobs of, it's going to be really hard for me in a job to wake up night and day to hours on end, do a nine to five for something I don't like to do and I don't see myself doing. If one, I know I don't see myself doing public health, how do you expect me to wake up for an 8 a.m. class? But even before I have that 8 a.m. class, I have to do a um, almost like an internship at another school. Friday early in the morning. Then go to my class. Then I'm in class until 8 p.m. Then I'm president. I'm, I'm vice president of one organization. I'm trying to start another organization. I'm taking 18 credits. I did terribly that semester. So um, come, when was it? About junior year, I took a leave of absence. I took a leave of absence for a semester um, because I just couldn't do it. And what they didn't tell me when I took that leave of absence was On my transcript, it's going to say that I took 18 credits and I earned zero with my leave of absence. So even though I took a leave of absence from my classes, no one ever told me that's going to show up in my transcript. So when it came to senior year and I transferred my major, all of the public health classes I took don't count towards my credits for my new major. So now I have all these new classes I'm going to need to take. And because it says I earned zero out of 18 credits one semester, there's a ratio that you have to stay in to to maintain federal funding. And I didn't know that when it came to credits. I knew there was a GPA requirement. I didn't know there was a specific credit requirement. So because I was below the credit requirement and no one told me, they were going to take my funding away unless I appealed. And they didn't, even, they didn't accept the appeal, even though I told them, look, I can finish everything in a semester in the summer. Give me the semester, the summer, I will have all of my, all of my requirements done for my psychology. Yeah, so, so your advisor at the time when you requested this leave of absence, they, they basically they didn't let you, they didn't warn you about any of this. No. So... She never told me when I take this leave of absence, my credits would be affected how they how it was. Um, and she also discouraged me from transferring schools on um, the entire time. So I actually did end up in senior year transferring to arts and science. And my one regret was listening to her when she said, don't even bother writing a letter because you're probably not going to get accepted with the GPA. My GPA was the exact same when I got accepted, when I finally got accepted. Mm-hmm. So the one thing I'll say about myself is I regret listening to her and not even trying to do it. Because she said, don't do it. You're not going to get accepted. Um, and I should have told myself, look, if I write this letter, they're going to let me into the school. I don't think SU, or I hope, they don't want me sticking with a major I do not want in a college I was never supposed to be in to begin with. And then I end up flunking out of school. So let me write this letter. Let me let them know why I need to do this and what I want to do. I ended up majoring in psychology. 
um, really good at it. I took a took a decent amount of psych classes um, throughout college. Um, my last summer at SU, I spent taking two summer classes for psychology, uh, which I still owe money to. But um, yeah, I think for minorities on campus, it's very hard to get the leadership we need um, when it comes to making decisions throughout, co throughout college. A lot of us are first generation college students. So when it comes to decision like that, there we don't really have a we don't really have a point of reference to okay, what should I do in this situation? Should I even take this leave of absence? No one is telling me, oh, your your credits are going to be affected this way, so don't do that. No one is no one before us is telling us when you get to school, um, avoid these classes or if you need help, if you need assistance, these are the resources you have. A lot of students on campus. For minorities don't know the resources that are that are available to them um and there's a lot of resources on campus i didn't know existed until i was a senior mm -hmm. that's four years after me being at su and i had no idea these things existed. wow yeah yeah you know i i can i can relate to 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 some of what you went through because i went through a similar thing myself and in, in syracuse it was it was tough um because coming in freshman year um you know, I thought I wanted to do chemistry. I like chemistry. And of course, you know, my parents were like engineering, da da da. You know how that goes. So I decided to try <laughs> chemical uh, engineering. And, and uh, you know, shout out to the engineers. Like, just, just what they go through, it's, it's hard, it's tough. And if, if you aren't, you know, passionate about actually wanting to be an engineer, or you know any of those just high level STEM uh, degree courses, it's really hard to to do well in them. Especially because just doing well means basically failing tests. Um, like I remember I would get like a forty seven, and, and that would be good thanks to uh, the curve uh, and and shit like that. But I just didn't. I wasn't enjoying myself. I wasn't happy, and. So I was like, all right, let me switch to mechanical engineering. And I did that my second semester. And I, I liked some classes, but um, there was a majority of the classes I did not like. And, and what I disliked the most about engineering were the professors. Just like in terms, of the, in terms of the actual work that they do to make sure that you understand something, they don't, basically. They'll tell you, they'll talk to you as if you already know something or a concept or briefly touch on a concept so there's a lot of self-teaching going on in engineering and a lot of group teaching and that was the first time where i just felt left out because i was i was you know like the only black person in this class and i'd see like other people forming study groups and they were like very close and I didn't know how to approach them, or I would try like half acidly, like, oh, you know, you know I'd, I'd love to pull up to the next session. And they'd be like, yeah, yeah. And that was that. So it, I felt like I was on my own. And, you know, therefore, I was doing terrible in my classes because I was like, fuck it, I don't, I don't really care as much. And so I did terrible that semester. And then I was like, all right, this is not sustainable. I need to switch majors, probably switch schools. And, I, and at first I thought, simple, like I'm, I'm in Syracuse, why would it be tough to switch within Syracuse? And then they hit me with that same 3.0 uh, that you need to switch out. And I'm like, how do you expect me to have a 3.0 when the reason I'm switching out is because I don't like it. So I'm obviously gonna like these classes. So what are we gonna do here? So I talked to my advisors and she discouraged me from writing a letter just like she dis uh, they discouraged you. But, you know, I was like, I'm just going to write a letter of appeal anyways. Um, and the first appeal got rejected. They were like, because I already knew what my, my next major would be. I said economics. So they said, we're going to reject your appeal now. But um, we're going to allow you to take some economic classes and courses. And if you do well in those uh, for this semester, and um, I, was, I said I was going to take some summer classes, then you can write another appeal and see if you get accepted. So I was like, bet. Um, I, I did that. Um, 
yeah, I did that. I, t I took econ classes. I took summer, uh, took summer classes, and it, it was tough, but it was pretty much like it's either this or you're, you're, you're basically fucked for, for the rest of the semester. So I had that just on my back end, and I was able to, to, to switch. And yeah, and luckily for me, you know, my, my advisors were still bad, but, you know, I had, I had people that I could talk to that to just guide me in, in the right direction. And it should never be up to a, a point or a case where a student, an SU student, has, is, makes a choice and isn't warned about the consequences, doesn't have the full information, and just finding the resources. Like, you mentioned, like, that you, you only, you discovered so many resources senior year. But the number one resource that was hard to reach that you were speaking of was your financial advisor, who happens to be the only one in the school. That's ridiculous. Like, people should not be hard to reach, especially faculty in, in these colleges. Like, it's one thing not knowing about a certain law or rule, but it's another thing not being able to reach the person that is their job to do that. Like, a department can't be made up of one person. Mm -hmm. So. I, I feel I feel for, for what you went through because it's not your fault at all. It's it's the institution and it's the system. That's you know what we speak of when we're talking about systematic anything, systematic racism, systematic disadvantage just for minority groups. It's the lack of information, the the lack of even effort to represent um, minority people, and that in the results just fucks up aspects of our lives that really can't there's nothing really you can do to to get the time either that you're wasting um trying to get that degree again or, or pursuing just to better your life like you, you just want to go to college just want whatever like a person just wants to work i just want to do my job and i'm getting stopped by the cops for no reason i'm just trying to get to work like we're just, <laughs> we're just trying to live our lives and it's frustrating it's frustrating for us as as minority groups, but it's something that like it's, it's fucked up that we're used to it. It's, it's almost like there it goes. What's your story? That's my story. Like, oh, what's your story? And and that's just a lot of times it's gonna be very similar stories. Yeah, yeah, man. And you know, just going back to to why why you reached reached out to me. Um, I think it was it was because of of the recent podcast I did with, with Anthony. Um, you texted that a lot of a lot of what you know, he was negating you, you went through. Um, and, you know, you just spoke on, on some of that with, with, with Syracuse. Mm -hmm. I, you know, really, what, what did you mean? Um, did you have anything in particular? Um, one of my main points, and it's a point that I, I hold very, very dear to me, is um, point about um, he doesn't, he doesn't, about police brutality and um he just doesn't see why there's this big uproar um with what the police are doing how they interact with with people of color um and it's almost like he sees it as oh but they're doing this to white people too it's not just black people so why are you guys why are you guys so upset about it um and with my own personal encounters i've had three separate instances with a police officer um since i've been here the first time was when i was either in the seventh or eighth grade seventh or eighth grade i was walking with my friends um i used to live in this flatbush at the time and we're walking down the block to go play basketball and they're walking ahead. I stop at my at my on my friend's porch to put my phone down, um, and then I'm, I'm running to catch up to them. So I'm running to catch up to them, and I run across the street. I go. Next thing we know, two police cars come, block us in. We're in seventh to eighth grade. We are no taller than five two at this time. Five three. Right. We are young black men we, we don't even know anything about the world and first thing they ask us is oh where you guys coming from like live we live on the next block we are 
20 feet away from the people we're going to meet to play basketball on the street. The basketball hoop is outside. Like we we're, we're where we're, we're we are where we're about to go. Um, and he said, "You guys have any weapons on you or anything?" And in my head, I'm like, "I have, sir, I have on basketball shorts and a tank top. Where do you think I would be hiding a weapon?" Um, and he says um, that a couple blocks away, this lady, she uh, had a gun pulled out on her by a group of by a group of boys, um, and they were going to rob her. Um, we saw you guys, and we, we saw you running, so we thought it was you. And then I'm thinking to myself, we had someone who who all who knew us on the block. We always we were always down there to play. So if it wasn't for him running up to the cops and saying, "Yo, I know these boys. They're good kids. They want to do that. They live right there. They're coming in front of my house to play basketball." Things could have gone so differently just because of the situation that had happened. This lady had gotten a gun pulled out on her in front of Bye Bye Group of Boys. So here you see us. Your only evidence against me is you see me running across the street. And you thought that was reason enough for two cop cars to block in four, four black middle schoolers to pat them down for weapons to see what they have on. Secondly, I was in high school, sophomore. Um, I used to live across the street from the deli. So I left my house, walked across the street to the deli. And I'm inside, I'm looking for Arizona. I, I think I got a beef patty from the deli. And I'm waiting for them to make it. So I'm looking outside, the door's open. I see the cop, there's this cop car with two cops inside. And they're just looking inside the deli. And it looked like they just kept looking at me. So I look away, I go back, um, still waiting still waiting for them to finish what I, what I ordered. I look outside again, they're still looking at me. So I go to pay and two officers walk inside. They're like, where are you coming from? I'm like, from my house. He's like, where do you live? I said, across the street. He's like, what's your address? I told him my address. He's like, you have ID. Do I really want to put my ID out? I don't even know why you stop. Why you're stopping me? You're not telling me. Right. I said, you know what? The second you start to ask questions, they gonna think you're agitated. They're gonna think you're, you're trying to start something. So I said, I said, here's my ID, officer. He starts laughing, and he's like, oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were someone else. You fit, you, oh, yeah, we got a description about someone. You fit the description about. I'm like, well, what's the description? He said, white basketball shorts, medium afro. <laughs> Sir, you are, in, you are in East New York. You are in East New York. And your only description about the person you're looking for is black, white basketball shorts, and a medium afro. I lived across the street from a basketball court. And you want to talk about white basketball shorts and a medium afro. That is every young black person around us. Yeah. And I, the thing I want Anthony to understand is, and I do believe he's never had to encounter this, but for a lot of people, and the reason that they're outraged is, if not them personally, they know somebody who's been affected by it. My friend growing up, his name is Kimani Gray. Have you heard about Kiki? Yeah. He's one of the people who was killed by cops. And his last words to the cop was, please don't let me die, as they shot him. This is a young boy begging for his life as you continue to shoot him. And I know his family and his father has already had to bury so many kids, whether it be to gang violence or what, what happened to Kiki. But that's the reason why there's so much outrage from, from, from people of color. That, that is why. Because for no reason, it could be you. 
on two separate occasions, I had nothing to do with what other people had done. And if only I'd acted differently, if, only, if I didn't listen, if I didn't comply, I'd be dead. Yeah, man, that's, that's the, the scariest. It's just like the one thing that's always in, in the back of really every black person's mind. Like with me, um, I've, I've been fortunate to not have any of those encounters, like a situation like you had with, with police in terms of just being stopped for no reason. And I'm just counting the days. Like, like, I don't know like how it would feel like if I did and nothing happened, just like with you, it's like, oh, I survived that. But you sort of like get experience, I guess, in terms of how to deal with, with cops and just knowing to be smart enough to comply if, if, if they're reasonable. But as someone, as a black person that hasn't really dealt with that, I'm just like waiting sort of on a day that it does happen and just wondering what will happen. Because I've seen instances where people have complied, just like you have, and it still um, took a turn for the worse. Um, I think just most recently, one of the, there was this like video, it was like five years old. But it was, it was of this guy, he, he was, he was a, in, in a hotel uh, or a motel, and he had his door open for, for whatever reason. Some people walked by, they thought they saw a gun, and they called the cops. And so the cops all come in, it's like mad cops, like maybe, I don't even know, 15. And you get to see the, the cops' point of view. And they're like, get on the ground. They all have their weapons out there. Get on the ground, on your knees, uh, on the floor, cross your legs. And he's complying, he's doing everything. He's like, why am I? Shut up, we're nervous already. And they're like, get up on your knees very slowly. But they asked him to cross his legs right before that. So in order to get on his knees, he had to uncross it because you can't physically you know, get on your knees without doing so. So he, he uncrossed his legs and they're like, don't fucking uncross your legs. I told you, we're nervous already. Like, we're, like the cops was, was basically saying, I'm ready to shoot. I'm very nervous. And he was unarmed. He had nothing on him. So finally he gets up on his knees and then they're like, crawl very slowly on your knees towards us. And I think he still had his legs crossed with some, some crazy shit like that. So he's trying to, trying to call towards the police. I think he loses balance and that was it. They just, they just let it rip on him. And I remember watching that video and thinking, you know, if I was in that situation, there's nothing, there's nothing you can do. There's like, I would be gone. Like, because you, you imagine, like, when you see a fight, like, oh, if I was in that fight, I could have weaved there, I could have did this, I could have did that. And in those situ situations, it's, it's checkmate. There's nothing you can do. And you're powerless. I took a, um, the summer where I took two psychology classes, I took, um, one of the classes I took was Intro to Research Methodology. Um, and my professor, she was telling me how she was currently doing a study about the implicit biases um, between police officers um, when they are encountering people of different races. And the study she was doing was um, she had people who, uh, I think she said they had a clicker and it was basically whether to shoot or not shoot. And different images would show up and in a split second, they had to decide if they were going to shoot the person or not shoot the person. And more times than not, when it was a black person or something associated with, with someone who, who was a person of color, they were going to shoot. And that's the thing with, with cops, with, with, with cops. It's the, they already have an implicit bias of who we are as people, one of which I blame the media, because black people in general are depicted um, are, are depicted one type of way. If you're a black woman in a film, you are depicted you are depicted as an angry black woman. If you are a um, young male in a film, you are an athlete, a drug dealer. <laughs> um, yeah. 
So, and then that's how we're depicted. So for people who think about someone who has never encountered a person of color, think about college. Think about all the white people on campus who have never had to be in a classroom with, with the person of color. Uh, maybe they went because they just never had to. Think about the, um, yeah, just in their life, they've never encountered someone of color. And the first time they do is on a college campus. But the only time you've seen a person of color is on TV. And they're only depicted one way. What are you going to think about? If it's, a, if it's a male, he knows how to play basketball or, or sports in general. He's an athlete. He sells drugs. Um, if you were to sag your pants, you are already a thug. I don't know anything about you, but that, that's the concept they want to have because that's what they see on TV. And it's the same thing with, with cops. We're depicted as one way to the media and to everything. Look, look, at, look at how the news are are um are showcasing people who are peacefully protesting all they show are the riots all they show are um people being aggressive but when you're actually there when you actually see what's happening it's it's all love um and people who are white black straight gay people of, of all origins of life coming together for a good cause but what does media show? They only show you show people burning down a target. Um, they only show the the ten percent out of ninety that's doing something bad, and that's life. That's how we're depicted. People only show you the bad things, and they never highlight the good thing. Which is why when it comes to an instance of oh, there's a black man with a gun, the first instinct is oh, he's an animal, let me be ready to shoot. So when a cop stops you on the side of the road and he sees a black man, he already has his his hand on, on, on his holster. If you're white, I bet he don't. If the cop asks you, okay, let me see some identification. If you're black, the assumption is you have a gun in the car. If you're white, let me wait to see your identification. And And that's just the reality. So if I know and I fear for my life, which is what seems to be the case, which I don't understand how you're the cop here with a bulletproof vest and a gun, and you stop me, you already know the, the climate of this country. How in the hell are you the person who fears for your life when me as a black man and knowing, the, knowing what's happening to other black men, I don't have a right to be scared. I don't have a right to question your actions and your motives and what you, what you plan to do. Okay, you asked me to reach for my wallet. Okay, I reach for my wallet, but I know you're gonna think I'm reaching for a gun, and that's the end of it. Yeah. So I rather not do anything, and then I don't do anything. You're resisting arrest. Yeah, arrest. It's, it's a lose lose situation. Um, and back to Anthony's point, back back to to me getting to what Anthony was talking about, and. That, that, that's what I don't think he understands. There's an implicit bias in just how the system is set up. If I drive by a cop, I immediately have to look in my rear view mirror to see if he's following me. Mm -hmm. White people don't, don't have to do that. And that's white privilege. You get the option of driving through any neighborhood and not wondering if people think you belong to them. So me and my family, we're currently looking for houses. Best believe we need to think twice if we're going to move into a neighborhood that's predominantly white because we now have a black family moving in. I don't get the luxury of walking around that neighborhood at night, especially let me let alone let me wear a hoodie. <laughs> okay. Oh man, it can't happen. Cause one, I don't belong here in the first place. I wasn't even supposed to be able to do this. Let alone I'm invading. It's going to be seen as me invading your space and the safety of your kids. Um, and I, I, I don't blame him for it per se, because again, he hasn't experienced it. He, he's lived a different life. Um, he said he lived in Westchester. I grew up in, in, in East New York and East Flatbush. So I had to deal with that with the cops and he's never had to do that. 
my the schools I went to growing up were predominantly black and Caribbean. Mm-hmm. It's probably dealt with more diversity in the school, right? So we just come from two different worlds and the probably the only time he's been exposed to I wouldn't say Syracuse is diverse because when you're really there, everyone is really pocketed. Yeah. But it's for the life he's lived, I think he's living in an ignorant bubble. Um, but I don't think there's malice to anything that he does or say or says. Like I love Anthony. I really do. Um, he's and I think people misunderstand him with what he posts um and and his viewpoint he definitely means well um and it's okay to disagree with somebody and we see this and we see this a lot you don't have to agree with what someone says don't bash them for their thoughts without understanding their view and we see that way too much you don't know a person but because they said something we're going to take it one way and run with um and i i know a lot of people get on anthony for that um they'll take what he says while i don't agree with it they're going to put him one way and run with it and i don't think he deserves that what he deserves is to have a conversation understand them and if you don't agree tell him why he's wrong and i definitely think there's a lot that he's wrong about i'm not going to bash you and call you names for for what you think because you probably lived your life one way you only know it one way. You don't have the same experience as that. Mm. Um, and that, that's something that, that we got to understand. We might not have the same viewpoints. You don't know his experiences. You don't know what he's been through. Right. But before you bash him and ignore the conversation altogether, sit down and educate about where he's wrong and why he's wrong. Okay, you think you don't think white privilege is a thing. Uh, you just think racism is this you know, systemic racism is an ideology. Okay, let me tell you the facts of why it's not. Let me tell you the real life experiences that people of color are going through in this country that is the reason as to why they're looting, why they're rioting. You know, there's, there's a lot to unpack and, and a lot of the points that you, just, that you just spoke about, just in terms of the climate in this country. And I, I agree to, to an extent with, with, with your point about Anthony, right? That's why during my, my podcast with him, one, I didn't know that um, he was as ignorant as he was coming into the podcast. Like, I knew that, I sort of knew that he was a Trump supporter, but really why I invited him was because of the whole controversy over social media involving the whole mm-hmm. thugs and delinquents thing. I understood where he was coming from, you know, just unbiasedly speaking, like, Technically, he's right. If you're looting, stealing shit, or whatever, you're moving away from the from the protest and okay. the message of the protest. Can I can I just say one thing? Yeah. Um, Trevor Noah. He I listen to the Daily Show all the time. Same. Um, and he said there's no right way to protest because that's what a protest is. It's it's going against it's going against something yeah so by me going against it you're going to see it as not not it being right so it being a peaceful protest against police brutality you're going to your people are going to say police brutality isn't a thing like like cops are not targeting people of color anymore that's not a thing that, that's what people are going to say and if you riot oh that's not the right way to do it we saw cops in, where was it, Buffalo, shove an old man who was just on the sidewalk. Yeah, that video was crazy. He's not riding. He's not doing anything. So you can do nothing, still have your life in jeopardy. But the reason people are looting and rioting is because, one, nothing has been getting done. And you got to put yourself in, in, in a lot of these people's positions. Do I think there are people who are taking advantage of the situation and they want to come up? Absolutely. Absolutely. But I don't agree with the looting. Do I agree with rioting? Yes. So I, there's a lot in this world that I think 
Anthony needs to see needs to change is this country. While I understand you can have love for this country, acknowledge the flaws that it has and that a lot needs to be fixed. Like the country itself was built off the backs of slaves. Like America was built off the backs of slaves and stolen from another group of people. Yeah. That's who, that's who it's always been. So you say you love America, but understand what, what this country from the beginning of its inception has stood for. Yeah. And, and yeah, that's, that's one thing that I discovered, right? Because what, 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 what the podcast with, with Anthony, coming into it, you know, as, as I mentioned, I thought that his only gripe with the protest or with the climate is in terms of the controversy he had with calling protesters rioters and thugs, was just the, the what, what we just mentioned, the rioting and thugs, right? And, and where, where, the, where the conversation took a turn, and when I realized these, these things about, you know, some of these uh, ideas that he has, was when I asked him, you know, do you understand why people riot and why people are, are you know, so angry up to the point? And it's because of some of just partially of the things that you just mentioned in terms of just the oppression and the peaceful protests that we've done before and how we trusted a lot to, to work and the justice system to work, but the justice system doesn't work because it's compromised. And, and that's when, you know, he spoke about not being able to see systematic racism, not understanding white privilege and et cetera, and et cetera. And, and you, you know, just reacting to that, you mentioned that, you know, Anthony means well, because he, he probably hasn't experienced some of the things you and I have and, and, and most of the people who understand this. And, and that made me, you know, think like, because I've been thinking about this just throughout these conversations and just in general when I think of ignorant people, because I myself, I'm like, are minority communities too understanding in terms of we understand why a person is ignorant or why a person is racist to almost down to, to the knot. Like, I understand why a person from the South may be proud of his Confederate heritage. Because if, if you're white and you're not exposed um, to Black people or Black communities, and growing up you hear about your grand, great-grandfather who was a general who fought against America, and this is what our family's proud of, and this, is, this flag embodies that spirit, and that spirit is in your blood. Why would you try to take that away from me and say and call me a racist when this is my heritage? We understand that. But our, our, our only point is understand our side too. Understand our perspective as well. And we're sort of forgiving, or not forgiving, we tolerate a lot more bullshit than we need to. And I think that's why things are so hot now because. We, we were, as a community and with our allies, we've stopped tolerating a lot in terms of if you're an ally of our community, action. We need action behind those words. That was the beginning of the protest. It's either you're with us or against us. And that forced people who are allies or, or, or say they're allies to actually take action and go out in the streets with us. And you see the whole world are protesting. And... So in terms of with, with Anthony, like, I agree with you. He, I don't think he's a bad person. I actually had an argument with, with one of my friends after that podcast because I, I was telling her, I was like, he's ignorant, but is he racist? That was, that was the, the argument that we were having because she was saying, yes, yes, he's racist because if you don't believe in systematic uh, oppression or white privilege or any of these things, then that makes you a racist. And I was like, that makes you ignorant, but does that equalize to, to racism? And the, the point where I sort of leaned towards her argument was when she said, all right, but he'll be in your way. Like the, the people like him who think like him are gonna sort of be in your way towards um, the end result of what we want. Like if, if, if there's a district attorney or a judge or somebody in the Supreme Court that doesn't believe in systematic oppression or whatever, 
there are going to be laws and, and, and things that just aren't going to go through just because they don't really see a reason for it. Um, I still don't think that Anthony's racist or anything because I feel like racist in terms of what a racist is, in my opinion, it's very intentional. It's very degrading in terms of I'm a better person. But I think there has to, there has to be a word just besides ignorant that sort of is, is like the middle ground like in terms of what that is. Because I can say that, oh, Anthony didn't experience some of these things and that's what shaped him. But throughout Syracuse, he was, he was in the minority community. Like he was always, he was with that community. He has a lot of friends in that community. And, you know, he lives in America. He's seen all these cases. When I talked to him, he saw these cases and he, he looked research. He doesn't believe in it because the media overhypes it. And that's true to an, ex an extent. But he, he researched for, to disprove it. Rather, I don't think he's done enough research to actually just educate himself on it. And he has to take some sort of responsibility for that. I think Anthony, again, I say Cuse is in a bubble by itself. Not by itself, but once you step on a Cuse campus, unless you are actively looking at what's going on around the world, you'll never know. And from the time I was a freshman, the days go by, the months go by, you forget what day it is. Yeah. Because you just don't know what's happening on the outside world. And we live on a hill within the community itself. Yeah. Um, and you don't actually see how bad Syracuse as Syracuse is until you leave the hill. And a lot of kids don't, just don't get to leave the hill. And I feel like that little small detail is similar to, to where Anthony lives. I feel like a lot of students on campus, they live in a bubble, even minorities. And they don't understand how bad Syracuse is because we live in a bubble. It's called the hill. Like Syracuse is on a hill. And I remember I was doing, um, I was helping this organization uh, in the Syracuse neighborhood um, where we were going through a heavily populated area that was majority refugees, like Somali, Somali refugees. Um, and we were asking them if they were going to vote um, or just people in general if they were going to vote. And you look at how these people are living and where they live. And to be frank, it's the hood. But people know Syracuse for, for destiny. Um, they, they, know, they know Syracuse for Armory Square or Marshall Street. That's what you're going to see. Yeah. But they don't know what goes on um once you once you leave they don't know that the highway that is right by right behind Lawrenson is literally the divide between what you see on tv about su on websites and the hood and once they put that highway there that's what caused that divide and i learned that in public health hmm. that highway and i think they're trying to remove the highway because of what what it has done um to the city of syracuse but I feel like that's kind of that's kind of the life Anthony has lived. And you just hear it in the way he talks about why he loved his country and everything you can do and um and your constitutional rights and um the power is in the and this idea of a democracy and the power being to the people, not the government. And he's lived in Westchester and now he's the homeowner down in Georgia and he was able to go to college as a, as a minority, as, as someone who's not from this country. He's about to become a citizen. He is literally living in the picture utopic idea of what this country is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Majority of the people who look like us don't get that opportunity. And I don't think he understands that. Um, and while I agree with your friend that Yes, Anthony. I don't see Anthony as being in the way. I see Anthony as a point of you're fighting for, we are fighting for a cause that hasn't been understood for centuries. 
of what true civil rights and equality look like, right? Yeah. Even in the way we're taught in school, we were taught that in elementary school, what were you taught about Christopher Columbus? He came, he discovered the Americas, and he 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 met the native the um the indigenous people, indigenous people, and it was all kumbaya. Right. <laughs> and when you get older, you actually find out what it was. But meanwhile, while we're in school, projects that we had to do in elementary school is make a longhouse and and um you would for for Thanksgiving around Thanksgiving you would have this whole Thanksgiving feast or potluck in your school and you come to find out it was a bloodbath when you when you were older. Yeah. And just the way we teach our kids nowadays about the history of this country and how things came to be, one, history is told in the eyes of the victim. So how things actually happen, you'll never know. And so our education system is flawed. You'll never know uh, the true reality of what has happened in our history because it's only the victors who are going to tell their side of the story. Um, so look, I say Anthony is ignorant and he, see the, the, he sees the glamour in this country for what it is, but with all the research he's doing, He's not asking the, the real question. Um, he wants, to, if, even if you say, okay, white people are shot more in by, by, by cops than black people. Don't just stop as at you see that white people are getting shot um, more times by police officers than black people. Look at the why. The why is because there are more white people in this country than there are black people. That's the why. So yes, you see the headline of white people are, are being killed more by cops. But until you dive deeper with your research, and I think that's that's more of what you're talking about. He's not looking for for um, reasons for the other side per se. I don't think he's diving deeper into even the research he's doing to support his own to support his own claim. Because you have a president who says. If we stop testing for the coronavirus, there'll be no cases. <laughs> if, if someone takes that as the bl- as a as the blanket statement as it is, they're gonna say, you know what? He's spitting right now. If we do stop testing, there'll be no cases. But it, it's also think that's the research Anthony is doing. It's so basic and it doesn't get to the root of the issue um, that you're not really understanding the reasons why these things are happening. Take the new Jim, you know about the new Jim Crow. Um, You have Bill Clinton who who came out with the the three strike method, the three strike rule, right? Let's ask ourselves why people of color are more more likely to be repeat offenses to have more repeat offenses and end up in prison. This is why. I get caught for a crime for a, fe- on, on, for a felony charge and I go to jail, right? One, before I even get to jail, you are probably going to have a public, a, a public defender. The, pu- the prosecutors are going to stack charges on you, right? So you probably, what would have been a fine or maybe a minimal jail sentence, Turns out, turns out you're going to do multiple years in prison because they're going to stack charges on you that they know wouldn't stick in court. But you have a public defender that that you need because you can't afford a real attorney, and your public defender has about 20 cases, other cases he has to he has to go right. So when the prosecutor says, "Oh," we're going to hit you with 30 years in prison unless you take this plea deal. You're going to say, give me the plea deal. I, I, I don't want to even risk doing 30 years if you take this to trial. Yeah. So you're going to take your plea deal. Now you're going to prison. You do your time and you get out. Once you get out, that is where it starts because now you're on probation. 
once you're on probation, you literally have to be a saint in the streets. A saint. And that's, it's, the rules of being on probation are so restricting, it's just not feasible for life at all, especially with people of color. Yes. Like, it's not feasible. So, as, let's say you went to jail for, you went to prison for a felony charge. Once you put a felon on, on a job application, you're probably not going to get the job. So now, so now I went to jail for X amount of years. I just got out. I need to work. I am forced to check felon. Now nobody wants to hire me. So what I'm going to do? I'm going to go back to the exact same job I had that landed me in prison. I'm going to, I'm going to go back to, to if I was selling, <coughs> I'm going to go back to selling. I'm going to go back to selling. So now I got caught again, two strikes. Now I'm going to jail for an even longer time than I did the first time. Now I'm going to get out again, several years down the line. Same process. I can't get a job because I'm still a felon. I'm a repeat. I'm a repeat. It's a repeat offense at this, at this point. Again, I can't get a job. I need to make money. I'm going to still go back to what I was doing before. Three strikes. Now they're going to throw the book at you. And that's it. it. Once you get out, you're on probation. You're probably going to be on probation for 10 years. For 10 years on probation, you're, you're most likely going to end up back in prison. And, and, and that, that's, it's in a system that is designed to, to literally hold, hold people of color down. Because once you get that first felony offense, your life is over. Because what? You can no longer, you can't vote. You can no longer vote. So my, so my voice is gone that I am granted freedom of speech. I am granted the right to do X, Y, and Z um, as a citizen of this country. That is my, that is my natural rights, right? But I committed this and now it's gone. Yeah. Right? But what was pre? What is prison supposed to be about? From from what they tell you, it's supposed to be about. It's supposed to be about rehabilitation. Yep. It's supposed to be about you learning from your mistakes and going back into the world and knowing not to do it again. In that, you know, it, it's supposed to be about rehabilitation. But how is it supposed to be about rehabilitation where you throw me back out? And then you strip away the rights I had before I went in and tell me, go do it. You on probation for 10 years, so we're going to watch you. Uh, any slip ups, you're going to be right back in. Come back out. You need to work. You need to find a job or else you want to go back into prison. But you also need to check that you're a felon on, on your job application. And you already know nobody wants to hire a felon. So nobody wants to hire a felon. I need, I need a job or so I'm going back to prison. And if I can't get a job, it's my fault. Yeah, Go, going, going off that point of actual rehab centers, like, which aren't prisons, if, if, if you're addicted to something, you go to a actually rehabilitation center where you're treated for your addiction, um, you're taught other ways to get out of that addiction, you're, you're instilled with tools that you need and then you're after you're gone you're put into a community aa meeting etc to make sure that you're consistent and you know those people when they apply for a job if they don't have a history of crime there's no place where you have to check i wasn't i was addicted to alcohol like <laughs> there's not any of that because you're re re rehabilitated that's the that's the whole point of what prison is supposed to be like a lot of you know some people make mistakes you should be allowed to make a mistake. Um, and that should not be a permanent stain. And you should not be looked at as a person that's just going to do it again. But, you know, we've, we've been talking for, for a minute. So I don't want to take up too much of your time. It's been a dope conversation. It's been going pretty quick. I have no idea. But, um, yeah, I, I want to, you know, towards the end of the podcast, you know, I, I told you this before we started recording. There's a story going along, dictated by my guests because I call the podcast pages and it's sort of instead of episodes it's sort of like the book of life and each okay. page has a character 
And, you know, of course, people can come back in the future, but I just wanted to be a little different. So you won't know the full story, like, because I'm going to tell you, like, the last two, two or three lines, because eventually it's, it's going to be long as fuck. I'm not going to keep repeating. And I think it's going to make it more interesting <laughs> just for people not knowing the full story but continuing the story. There's a, a homeless man named Rick. There's a... Cardi B, and <laughs> there's Bill Cosby. So okay. it goes, a, a homeless man named Rick and a man, this is, the man is unnamed yet. So a man and a homeless man named Rick go for a walk, then suddenly a vortex opens up in front of them, and they see two figures who then offer them a drink. And the figures come out to reveal themselves, and it's Cardi B and Bill Cosby. And then a second vortex comes up. I mean, Cardi, yeah, Cardi B says, think fast. And the second vortex comes up and swoops Bill Cosby out of there. <laughs> so somebody would, would, did not fuck with Bill Cosby being there. So they swoop Bill Cosby out of there. So that, that's where you get to continue the story. So the last line is, um, a second, Cardi B says, think fast. A second vortex comes up and Bill Cosby gets sucked into it and the vortex closes. So um, just to remind you, a man and a homeless man named Rick go for a walk. Vortex opens up. They see two figures who offer them a drink. Bill Cosby, Cardi B. Cardi B says, think fast. Bill Cosby gets sucked into another vortex. And you can say whatever you do want. I get do I get to give the other man a name? Yeah, you can do whatever you want. You can, you can say, you can say, you can use that as part of your sentence. The man, Pablo and Rick, then blah, 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 whatever. The homeless man. Well, okay, Rick um, goes with Cardi B and his long lost nephew, Morty, um, through the second vortex to go find Pill Cosby. <laughs> First sentence. Um, you only get one sentence. Oh, it's only one sentence? Yeah, you okay, can start over if you want. Is that it? Um, you know, they go on an adventure to go, to go find Pill Cosby. Again, man, thank you. Okay, bro. Thank, thank you for uh, you know, being a part of the podcast. Really appreciate this, man. It was dope. It was, fun. It was, it was good. Uh, hopefully, soon we'll have that one piece discussion, though. Facts, facts. In the future, I'm sure you know you'll be um, a guest again because we gotta keep track of this journey. <laughs>